Hi everyone, my name is Drake Stutzman and I'm talking about melodrama, male costume, and superfly today. Uh, so the costume conference is about costume agency in particular, and so I want to talk about the costumes in the 1972 African-American crime film Superfly, which can be read as uh, proactive visual defiance of oppression. So I'm going to make one point and place Superfly's costumes in the context of clothes and costume used as subversive tools against extreme, extreme oppression, especially in African-American history. So the film, let me tell you something about the film. The New York, uh, it's a New York crime film. It's cast and crew is largely African-American. The director was Gordon Parks Jr. It was very low budget, like about $300,000, but in two months, it grossed $11 million. It was a, um, considered in some sense the first, one of the first black exploitations, but it's argued that it is in fact pre-black exploitation, but it's in that kind of genre. The location is 1972 New York, particularly in Harlem. The plot is about a drug dealer who wants to leave the drug trade and the script underscores racism as a frame for his life. Uh, the costumes for the lead, whose name is Young Blood Priest, are dramatic, large, stylish, and cannot be ignored. You can see the poster like emphasizes that particularly. So let me tell you a little bit about these. So the, the one in the middle of what you're looking at is this beautiful maxi coat that has matching pants, and he wears a white turtleneck underneath. This is a white wool coat with a diamond, uh, very sort of... Um, uh, streamlined diamond look. Uh, on the far left, you see he's wearing a leather uh, suit, which is um, saddled with suede and has buckle features. And there's, of course, the poster which shows the, the uh, maxi coat. Uh, here's another one where he's wearing a black pants and a black top, which is uh, outlined um, it with white, uh, like a white trim around the pockets and the collar, uh, again with a white turtleneck underneath. It's very, very simple. And then he's wearing a suede coat that is knee length uh, buckled. A lot of his clothes are often closed, uh, they're fastened together. And then this beautiful outfit that he wears, it's a suede jacket that is cream colored suede with this um, very dramatic, uh, brown suede pattern around the collar. It's beautiful. So the costume designer is Nate Adams, and he deliberately dresses Priest for impact. He's unlike any other male actor in the film. Uh, Priest is dressed with a very streamlined silhouette. He stands out in that way, a monochrome palette, which is these browns and grays, blacks and whites, and a very sort of large look. So Superfly's struggle is really a melodrama theme. It's, yes, it's about crime, it's about the drug crime, but as Darius James describes it, Priest is fighting for his own redemption, which is very true, it's in the script. And the New York Times in 1972 actually describes Superfly as a melodrama. So it uses two melodrama tropes. So one is the trope of injustice, which is a very um, typical part of melodrama. Um, and in the 18th and 19th century, some melodrama was considered illegitimate theater and they were banned from using scripts, classical scripts, and they really relied on the visual. And they would take a genre story and they would subversively address a socially forbidden issues within it. So it could be slavery, uh, it could be um, working class injustice, but it was revealing systemic injustice. So Superfly is really about Priest's struggle to be his true self. He talks about this. And it uses the genre drug crime story to convey deep issues about racism and black identity. So the costumes tap into illegitimate theater's visuals as subversive. And so the second trope is the visual, which is visuals carry melodrama's story. And as Jane Moody puts it in her uh, study of illegitimate theater, mute performance, that is the visual, is one of the illegitimate theater's most evocative forms of expression. So Thomas L. Sasser in his discussion of melodrama um, talks about how there is a, a common melodrama theme, or at least a strong melodrama theme, has been a focus on suffering and victimization. And, and this is a very important line for this particular study on Superfly, it's the claim of the individual in an absolute society, absolutist society, which is what Superfly is doing. So the film recontextualizes crime as racism, blocking the black individual from self-definition. Priest's friend says to him, sees their futures as faded together, 
And he says, you have a fantasy of getting out of the life, the life of crime. He says, what else can you do but hustle? So Priest's eye-catching streamlined costume express the man and the costume as one. They claim self-definition against an absolutist society. So in melodrama, the costume is really paramount. And uh, in 19, 1892, about the great actor, superstar on the stage, Henry Irving, uh, the critic Clement, Clement Scott described um, uh, uh, Irving's costume as, as so exciting. It was a living picture that exactly fascinated the eye. And he felt that it deeply told what the role was about. He says, we see at first glance how the actor intends to read his character, right? How he's going to portray the character is carried in the costume. So just again, to give a little emphasis on how important costume was, this is the opening page of the script for a very, very popular play of the 1820s, Tom and Jerry, which I'm gonna to come to, but you can see I've outlined in red at the top, this is the opening page of the actual script where costume takes up really three fourths of the page before you even get to stage directions. It's very detailed description of what the costume should be. So the other thing is to give uh, the drug trade some context because in Fenty's script, Philip Fenty is the screenwriter, in his script he deliberately says that drug dealing is a consequence of racist, racist exclusion from other work. So he, he emphasizes, the script emphasizes that African Americans need legal work, legal citizenship, legal rights, legally endorsed property, and rights backed by the justice system and the constitution. So there's a context, a historical context to the narcotics trade, which is since the 1500s, the drug trade has been a mainstay of American capitalism through the use of drug foods, which are sugar, coffee, tea, chocolate. They all get you high, as we all know. And all of these were trades that profited from the enslavement of people, particularly African Americans. So also little known detail in 1890s USA, the widespread, there was widespread cocaine addiction among the entire population, but African Americans were targeted in particular by doctors, lawyers, writers, as fiends and pushers. So then you come to 1972, where again, another great pressure is unemployment, which is at 11%, over 11%, and it's twice that of whites just in 72. So if you look at supervised costumes, they come from a long tradition of clothing and costume as activism. Um, Helen Bradley Foster describes how uh, slaves use clothing since the 1600s to hold cultural coherence and personal identity. It was a protest. So she says, she writes, even though they did not legally own their bodies, American slaves still managed to reveal themselves as individual and communal human beings by their dress. It was a refusal to accept cultural annihilation by refusing to give up their style. They freed themselves. So in the next centuries, in the 1820s, you have, again, clothes as protest, as subversion by African-Americans. Uh, so there's the phenomenon of the black dandy. These are free African-American men in the Northern cities. They dress with flair, wealth and style. You also have them in Europe, but in, in any case here, she, uh, Monica Miller and her great um, study of the black dandy, she says that the black dandies in the 1820s, they use dress, style, gesture, and wit to redesign the roles assigned them. They illustrate and mediate the political, social, and cultural visibility in an age of colonialism, imperialism, and revolution. So visibility is key here. Close as subversion, again, connecting the black dandy with the rise of black theater, which again is starting in the 1820s. So Barbara Lewis argues that black dandies' defiance of racism in publicly staging their clothing, of which they had a lot of pushback, inspired the new 1820s black theater companies. So the first black theater company in the States was the African Grove Theater, found in 1821, well, in, in America. William Brown at Mercer Street and Broadway in New York, William Brown was the founder. And if you know New York, you'll know that address. So the African Grove Theater has been described as ultimately guerrilla theater, even though it put on Shakespeare's and various kinds of plays. It was subversive in various ways. It did start in the 18, 1816 as an open air tea garden. 
and politics really mixed in theater in the in the century in particular. It was it was just the center of culture in many ways in 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 all cultures. Free African American men in New York were a very large uh, voting bloc, and they were of course. Uh, a major audience in the African Grove Theater. So there's an intermix there. And there was the pushback on the theater was in part for the political threat. So uh, I just give you one little example of some of its subversion was Tom and Jerry, this international success. Everybody played Tom and Jerry. Um, and they would adapt it for their own areas, their own sort of towns and that kind of thing. So they adapted, African Grove Theater adapted it for Black New York, and uh, here is the flyer for it. And as you can see, they've added on the slave market. And here it is, Life in New York. So just also to add, Ira Aldridge, who was a super, superstar in Europe and in Russia, uh, was born in New York. And he did start at the African Grove Theater. Here he is as Shylock, as Othello, and as Zanga, which was uh, in one of the melodrama revenge plays. And you can see his costume is very huge and really magnificent. He even hefted around. So black theater in the 1820s really was a political force. And that political force and that sense of how to uh, use black stories or um, bring them into the drama uh, was uh, echoed again, uh, continued really in the 1910s and 1920s in W.E.B. Du Bois's propaganda plays, which had been described as having a specific political purpose to end the oppression of black people. This continues in the 1970s in Superfly because Superfly is fighting for his own redemption. And so priest costumes are politics, dandyism, masculinity, and melodrama. And it really is mute expression of a declared agenda. Thank you.